This talk is very much based on my um, experience in Cambodia in 2013 and 2014, which is during the period of my field work for the research for my dissertation, which is currently being revised, trimmed enormously, and added to um, for a book project called Gods of the Soil. But this um, presentation itself and the argument embedded within is more sort of a reflection on the period of field work, which to me feels like uh, a safe distance now, being six years out, that I can touch it as historical material more than <laughs> as a amateur journalist. Um, <clears throat> so it's a bit reflexive that way. Um, but something else that I've been working on, uh, I work in a large uh, regional public university, right, but it's about the same size as PACE, is in uh, digital humanities, and I've been working with the University of British Columbia on uh, the database for religious history. Um, so it's just something that I'll throw out there to plant seeds for those of us who are teachers, but uh, if you were to go on there and search the term Cham, you would find uh, these incredibly informative entries <laughs> by <coughs> Uh, experts in the field, and right, and you would see um, that I've really only focused on the material in Vietnam so far. But this gives you a sense of what um, individuals who are intellectuals in Cham communities in Cambodia during the course of the 20th century are very much looking back towards and reconstructing as their own historical memory for political purposes. This is. Uh, land that they remember as associated with particular religious communities, and uh, it is associated with contemporary Cham minority religious communities in Vietnam, but the perception of those communities in Cambodia has its own sort of take. Um, <clears throat> and so if you were to, uh, for example, speak to people in the field in Cambodia, you might find perspectives that say that this is, you know, an old Hindu kingdom for example. Uh, it, it was not really, but sure. Um, so you might also find perspectives that argue you know, that the last kingdom here um, along the coast was at one point uh, ruled by a person who was recognized by the Malay sultanates as also a sultan, which is true. Right? <laughs> He's given a sort of nominal title as a sultan. But the most important part is it is the last sort of sovereign uh, land that is identified as a homeland for this population that could be best described as an Islamic minority diaspora community living in Cambodia, which is very important in the context of Cambodian politics in the 20th century. But it's also important in terms of thinking of the way that <coughs> Cham communities in Cambodia have constructed their own history in a uh, period in the 1980s, 1990s, and through the present, especially through looking back to this uh, figure who is a 19th century Wali saint, Kalma Imam, <coughs> Imam San, whose grave is pictured here, who is very much still venerated as a Wali saint figure, especially because of his relationship with the Cambodian monarchy. Uh, he had a very special relationship with the Cambodian monarchy, this sort of mystical relationship, um, protected hunting trips and so forth, uh, had dreams and visions that allowed him to predict the future, depending on who you talk to, of course, the stories change. But nonetheless, there is this sense that in the 19th century, this very close relationship between Cham Muslim communities in Cambodia and the Cambodian monarchy because of this figure. And he's sort of akin to um, Sheikh Salim Kishti in the Mughal Empire, where you have this sort of uh, Wali saint-like figure who forms a relationship with the monarchy. Uh, but in this case, you have a Buddhist monarch and a Muslim minority population. This is really important in the contemporary context because the group that is envisioned as being still closely linked to Kaum Imam San is additionally a sort of double minority in Cambodia because of their saint veneration. So from the 1950s, especially from the 1960s through the 1970s, as these Kaum Muda and Kaum Tua debates transposed themselves from the Malay Peninsula up through Bangkok and then through Badenbong 
into the central Cambodia, uh, this group becomes the group that is viewed as the traditionalists. <clears throat> so that is something to keep in mind moving forward. Previous studies of the position of uh, communities in Cambodia, in especially looking at Cambodian elections and Cambodian politics, have uh, been numerous, but there's a particularly excellent study by Sullivan from 2016. But it's just the questions of this study are really looking at the role of international complacency, uh, the lack of pressure that is being put on the Cambodian government that is allowing Cambodia to transform into this sort of de facto single party state. Um, <clears throat> an additional two studies have looked especially at the role of the Vietnamese minority population in Cambodian politics, especially as a group that um, gets targeted by both the Cambodian People's Party and the Son Ran Si faction as a sort of outgroup in the 2000s, uh, for basically the 21st century. Additionally, within the field of Cham studies in Cambodia, <coughs> studies of Cham Muslim communities tend to focus on essentially two issues first. Uh, the Cambodian genocide and the memories of that community as survivors of the genocide. And then also, <clears throat> second, very much anthropological studies with uh, historical studies only recently emerging within the past decade or so as a distant third. Right? So there's very much this sort of practice questions. Uh, one of the best new studies is a book by Philip Brookmeyer, which examines the process of what is called Jawiization. It's his term, um, which is looking at the Jawi or Malay influence in Muslim communities in Cambodia from uh, the 1920s through the 1960s, especially. So it's a particularly innovative argument. Um, being a historian that's also concerned with the sort of social fabric of history and having done work in the archives, um, I can tell you that probably the literacy in Jawi in this room is much higher than it was in Badenbong in the 30s, right? So, uh, and this is just based off of, uh, for example, records of uh, nominations of imams for public office that are being approved by the Cambodian royalty and the French colonial government, where these imams will go through the towns and villages and collect signatures and you notice that the signatures are all in, <laughs> if they're in Jawi, they're all in the same handwriting, right? <laughs> and then you get to X's and thumbprints at the end of the registrar, right? But you want to show that you're a populist, and you're popular with the community, you've got your base, and that allows you to um, be supported by the French colonial structures as a potential administrator, and also be blessed by the Cambodian royal structures, right? So this is a sort of, deep interwoven fabric of royal power and also colonial power that is existing in Cambodia pre-independence. So <clears throat> what I'm interested in is how historical conditions have shaped the positions of Cham communities in Cambodia. Not so much the way that they are, although I do have a kind of Sufi historian bent seeking the truth, right? But um, <clears throat> the symbolic role of these communities and how that they operate within the structures of sort of demonstrating power for Cambodian royalty and what role that might play for contemporary Cam Cambodian politicians. <clears throat> so um, if you're interested in contemporary anthropological studies, right, you get a lot of this um, material. This is uh, the Maulid for the Prophet Muhammad. And um, this is in a common Mamsan community. But something that is quite striking about this sort of um, public demonstration here is that they're blending uh, these sort of offerings that are very much look like uh, Cambodian Buddhist offerings of food and so forth with um, Muslim dress that is from the Cham Muslim community that's recognized by Cambodians themselves as being Muslim dress. And especially the green dresses and the black dresses 
and then music that is traditional Cham music, but includes instruments that are very much from this greater Indian Ocean world, uh, the rabat and so forth. So <clears throat> the source material that I'm relying upon um, is field work, but also um, historicized anthropological accounts, as well as um, some National Archives material in various languages, uh, some Cham manuscripts, but also uh, some journalistic accounts that are much more contemporary for areas that I wasn't able to personally uh, investigate. Right? Um, of course, this is a bit limited in terms of more contemporary investigations because especially from roughly uh, 2014 onward, there is increasing restrictions on an already restricted press in Cambodia. Um, so that is a limitation of that particular source material. Now, setting the stage for this sort of <laughs> contention in Cambodian politics, in the 1990s you have the emergence of a very clear opposition party led by Sun Ran Si, who um, is the sort of individual that is imagined to be an opposition candidate perhaps much more than he is, especially by the international community working in Phnom Penh, right? The international <laughs> individuals working in Cambodian uh, politics and investigating Cambodian politics really want to see a multi-party system. And uh, what they're contending with is the fact that Hun Sen has returned to Cambodia, um, sort of mythically riding upon a Vietnamese tank, and uh, <laughs> has never lost an election, ever. It's the longest reigning head of state, well, second longest in the continent. Um, but this all sort of peaks in 2013 in this enormous gathering in Freedom Park where uh, Sun Ram Si is leading up to the elections. Uh, they lose the elections and then there's a crackdown in the party and there's this gradual transformation into this single party state. Um, <clears throat> and one of the key questions here is, shall Vietnamese gain citizenship? Right? What is the role of minority communities? Of course, against the backdrop here, I won't go into all of the details, but we do have some of the issues that we have talked about um, in various papers already, such as Bilal's paper, right, where we sort of have these overlapping networks of Saudi and Kuwaiti funding, um, especially for Om Al Khora schools and the RIHS, and then uh, especially from the position of American governance in Cambodia, putting pressure on those organizations to pinch the funding networks, and how Cham communities are responding to those conditions, right? Sort of trying to play in between. Um, RIHS does emerge uh, in the last decade with having a relatively more solidified position. They get more support, and so this is a new mosque that was just being constructed in 2013. <coughs> it's quite large. Um, Nonetheless, uh, within this circumstance, from the perspective of leadership in Shan communities, especially uh, from the position of the Grand Mufti, criticism of Hun Sen and the CPP is viewed as particularly um, unfruitful, unexpedient, not worth it. <clears throat> so there are some uh, odd relationships that emerge here. During the 2013 elections, uh, there's a land contestation that occurs in Chang Jumriya, which is just north of Phnom Penh. But also, Hun Sen himself has this very sort of odd takes. They're like these, um, in American politics, you call them gaffes. And they're just like public statements that he makes that are just totally obtuse. Like, he loves the Cham community, right? He just loves Cham. Nobody loves Cham more than him. Right? <laughs> so to speak. Um, you know, but he also picks up on these kind of mythos like, oh, well, Cham Muslims don't drink, so like, they don't get drunk, so they're not promiscuous, so they don't have HIV and AIDS, and that's great for society. Right? They're just like totally bizarre statements, but he seems to get away with them. Um, <clears throat> so, um, for example, he also says in a Chattamuk Conference Hall Quranic recitation, which is this big sort of national presentation, you know, uh, and, and he's probably thinking about the conditions in Myanmar and Thailand here, but Cambodia's Muslims are so lucky. They're just so lucky to be in Cambodia. 
right? <laughs> um, so, yes, but that does not mean that there isn't this land dispute that's going on at the same time. And of course, uh, we have staged selfies in the role of so social media. Um, <clears throat> now, the use of historical memory is what, I, what I'm sort of interested in here, in his rhetoric in particular. So he says, the Cambodian king has always allowed Cambodian Muslims to pray at the royal palace, such as for his birthday, which is kind of made up, but a useful fact to have people believe. <clears throat> Additionally, um, he counts these large sort of financial contributions for recitations, new mosques, and things like this. And then eventually, this leads to the Grand Mufti declaring his support for the 2013 election. Uh, gradually, <clears throat> you see these contestations where uh, opposition party, the Cambodian, uh, the CNRP, attempts to appeal to Chan Muslims to address this sort of systemic discrimination. Um, but that appeal fails. But again, the CPP response is what is most indicative of the circumstance, right? The logic is, could Cha Muslims have joined him, Kim so Ka, the opposition leader, if they were repressed? They joined the opposition party for a formal meeting, therefore they must not be repressed. Right? That's the logic there. <clears throat> so nonetheless, you do have some international reporting, especially from Al Jazeera that investigates these conditions and complicates these accounts that are being circulated within Cambodian politics. So <clears throat> here, just to uh, sort of conclude, what I'm trying to suggest is that there is a repositioning of the Grand Mufti and a recentering of power of Chan Muslim communities in Cambodia throughout the course of the 19th and the 20th century. And this has to do with the position of the Akhnia, which is essentially a royal appointment for a person who might be a Buddhist monk, uh, might be a public figure, or they might be, in this case, a Kaji. And um, <clears throat> especially in the case of the current Grand Mufti, his position has also physically moved from an island that is a little bit east of the capital city, where this sort of senior Muftis had power in the middle of the 20th century, to the post-genocide period, this period of um, reconstructing suburbs north of the city, and the construction of new mosques in this community in Changchungri. And so this is a sort of um, <coughs> reconstruction of a new mandala in Phnom Penh, where you have the symbolic position of the Muslim minority community emphasizing the royal authority within that context. So, <clears throat> contemporary elections, 2017, this, this is a <laughs> sort of convincing circumstance here, a stellar performance from the CPP, um, not just playing off with this statement like Cambodia's democratic society, there's free press, open religion, and so forth, but also um, that the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia have closed case two, right? And this is a clear demonstration of the effectiveness of the Cambodian government to just mystically sweep the elections and crush all the potential opposition parties um, for the biggest indicator here is the councillor seats, which are at the district level. So even the royalists only take 28 of some almost 12,000 available seats. So this is um, what I think I would suggest and argue is one piece of the sort of symbolic role of the solidification of power here that illustrates that interplay between um, religious minority communities and the state in Cambodia. Thank you.